Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. India is in the throes of the world's worst COVID-19 outbreak. In a special bonus episode today, Dr. Josh Sharfstein talks with Dr. Amita Gupta, chair of the Johns Hopkins India Institute, Dr. Rondeep Galeria, director of the All India Institute of Medical Service in New Delhi, and Dr. Gangandeep Kang, professor of microbiology at Christian Medical College in India, about this unprecedented public health disaster and what needs to be done to address the crisis. This episode is excerpted from a Facebook Live video that aired on Thursday, April 29th. To watch the conversation, please visit facebook.com slash Johns Hopkins SPH. Let's listen. Hello, I'm Josh Sharfstein, the Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today, we're going to talk about the coronavirus crisis in India with three terrific uh, guests. We'll be hearing from Dr. Randeep Galeria, the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, from Dr. Gangadeep Kang, the professor of, a professor at the Christian Medical College in Valor, and Dr. Amita Gupta, professor of medicine and international health at Johns Hopkins and faculty chair of the Hopkins India Institute. So let's jump in. Uh, I'd like to talk first to Dr. Galeria. Um, Could you uh, give us your sense of the current situation of the COVID pandemic right now in India? So the current situation in India is pretty grim. We're seeing a huge spike in the number of cases and uh, this is really causing a huge strain on the healthcare infrastructure. We were in a very good position somewhere in January and February when our cases were very low and we had rolled out the vaccine program. But I think because of these two factors, the cases being low and the vaccine program being rolled out, a number of individuals and people felt that the pandemic was more or less over. And this led to people lowering the guard. There was a lot of events happening, a lot of functions and uh, the crowds started gathering. At the same time, uh, I think uh, what we saw was that there were new variants entering into the country which were more infectious. And the combination of a variant which is more infectious with lack of COVID-appropriate behavior, which is also due to the fact that people have had these restrictions going on for more than one year and many were just fed up of these restrictions, led to a huge surge in the number of cases. So the spike that we saw as far as the second wave was concerned was not only larger than the first wave, the rate of rise was very, very rapid. If it was to say that it was like a a mountain uh, in the last time, this time it was almost like a rocket. It went up straight. And this caused a huge surge in the need for oxygen beds, in the need for ICU beds, because not only did we start seeing a huge number of cases, the turnaround time for patients who were in the hospital was was sort of compromised. If you had patients who kept coming at a, at a, at a slower pace, you could still discharge some and take some more uh, in. But if you had patients coming in very rapidly every day, the system would become uh, sort of difficult uh, to, the system would not be able to sustain. And this is what has happened in the second wave. And let let me ask you, is this um, focused on particular areas of the country? I know India is a large country, many different cities. Um, Or is it focused in maybe just a couple major areas right now? So it's still localized, but it's spreading to different areas. And in my opinion, the pandemic is moving. It started off with the western part of the country, states like Maharashtra, uh, Kerala, and the western coast. It's now moved a little bit to central India, and we're seeing cases coming down a little bit in Maharashtra, but spiking as far as central India is concerned, Madhya Pradesh, Delhi, Punjab, all of these are seeing uh, a huge spike in the number of cases. And I think now it's moving a little bit more eastwards, with the cases going up a lot as far as West Bengal is concerned and the eastern states. 
So as we've seen in the US also, the pandemic tends to sort of move from area to area in terms of the number of cases and where it peaks. And I think in India also, there will be different peaks in different areas. Now you uh, are responsible for a major health system. What are What's the perspective from the health system right now, seeing all these patients coming in? What are you, um, you know, what are your urgent priorities? So our urgent priorities is to increase the number of beds, have a regular supply of oxygen and really get more and more human resources. I've, we've been doing that regularly. Currently in our hospital, we have more than 900 patients admitted who are COVID positive. Most of them are much uh, sicker than what we have seen in the last wave. Almost everyone is on oxygen high flow nasal cannula, NIV, or on mechanical ventilator, on, on a ventilator. And we have more than 100 patients waiting for a bed in our emergency. And we're just struggling to really find uh, beds for them. Today only I've started opening up more and more wards in our uh, hospital. We've converted our National Cancer Institute, which is a 700-bedded uh, cancer hospital, into a COVID hospital. We've converted our trauma center, which is for trauma care, wow. into a COVID center. We've converted a burns and plastic surgery building into a COVID center and now our main building, two floors to add another 100 beds we're working on tonight to really do the partition, develop donning areas, doffing areas and make sure that the infection control practices are there as far as air conditioning is concerned. So every day I'm, I'm, we're struggling to open up more and more beds. We're trying to get more uh, human resources, people to come in to manage these cases and at the same time, have a regular supply of uh, sub, uh, of oxygen, of equipment, and consumables as we will need them. Wow, have there you ever seen a number of cases? Wow, have you ever seen a crisis like this hit the Indian health system before? Not that I have seen. I don't think any of us would have ever seen a crisis of this magnitude that we've seen right now. Uh, okay. It's something which is really sort of, if I may put it. For a clinician, very, very heartbreaking to see so many patients and having that frustration that you're not able to do more. Uh, every day, it's, it's. I mean, well, you're trying, trying your best, but it's very depressing also. Let me be very honest about that. I, I, I hear that. And it's really requiring just tremendous efforts by so many to keep up with the situation. I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Kang. Um, beyond just scaling up the medical response, what else needs to happen urgently in India to respond to this crisis? So if we look at what's happening and what has been described so well by Randeep, I think one of the things that I'd like to point out before moving to answering your question is what you mentioned before, that India is a large country and where I'm located, which is 2,000 kilometers away from Delhi and in a city that is 1 20th the size of Delhi, we are still waiting for it to get to a point where um, we won't be able to handle it. We currently have all of our ICUs full. We are located in a state that is an oxygen surplus state. It's a state that generally has better infrastructure than the rest of the country. But we have currently 600 admissions and are ready for 1,200 uh, in the next week. So. Mm -hmm. There are parts of the country that are not at the same stage that Delhi is at, and I hope our preparations have been enough, but we don't know that and will not know that till we get through the next month, I guess. So, but so, in, so in your area, what else is being done besides getting ready for patients? What, what else um, is the focus? So Tamil Nadu is, again, fortunate in being one of the few states in the country that has a public health infrastructure, that has a department of public health. And we have started restricting a lot of activities. So the size of gatherings obviously is restricted, but major shops are closing um, People are being fined for not wearing masks. Uh, hospitals have been told no elective surgeries. Um, 
shift as much as possible to teleconsultations and be ready. The district administration is very involved and is trying to make sure that every hospital in the region is as prepared as possible. In addition, we also have home care, which is run by the hospitals. So currently our hospital is managing 400 patients at home. And that is with regular phone calls and if required, visits from the medical staff at the hospital. So I think this will continue and this will be certainly something that we will look at expanding in the days to come. One thing that I hold out as some measure of hope that we won't be as badly affected as last year is because last year we had a lot of our staff off because they were either infected or exposed and had to be in quarantine. We are going into this now with over 95% of our staff having been vaccinated. We have over 10,000 employees and uh, our vaccination figures are really pretty good. And for the medical staff in Tamil Nadu, this is something that the Tamil Nadu administration is insisting on. I want to ask you a little more about that. So we have the medical response, then there's the public health response, which sounds like is strong in your area, but maybe not as strong in other parts of the country. And then there's vaccination. What is the, um, you know, the outlook for vaccination, the current status and outlook for vaccination for India as a whole? And, and how does that play into, you know, the, managing this, this urgent crisis? So I think when we got started with vaccination in the middle of January, we started very slowly. And perhaps that was something that was appropriate because we were doing adult immunization for the very first time. Now uh, we are vaccinating at between three and three and a half million a day. And for a country the size of India, that's really not sufficient if we intend to immunize about 70% of our population. We need to scale that up. But the problem now is supply because we were told sometime last year that we would be at 120 million doses being produced in India by the end of December 2020. And in April, we are looking at a supply that is about 70 million. So every month there is a shortfall of 60 to 70 million doses that were expected to be available and just are not. So now I think we are at a stage where supply is um, the rate limiting factor in allowing us to expand immunization programs. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to you, Dr. Dr. Gupta. I know that you have done a lot of work in your career in India, uh, as well as in the United States. How is the world responding to India? What more can be done? Yes, and I want to thank my um, my colleagues uh, who are really uh, valiant fighters on the ground and have, have come through a remarkable journey to date. And similarly, as the other country that's uh, faced a huge uh, challenge with COVID, I think there are many things we can do. Um, so I think one of the main areas is that, you know, we've been sort of advocating for the Biden administration to really pull out all of the resources uh, with the invitation of the Indian government to provide key supply chain needs, both for the short term around the oxygen supplies, the medical supplies, um, and to use whatever available uh, resources they have to support that effort. The second is to obviously, you know, the vaccine supply is not is critical. I mean, if we cannot address what's happening in India, we none of us will be, I mean, safe. What happens in India matters to the entire world. Um, and, and that's really, uh, the, the, we care both from a humanitarian perspective, from a public health perspective, and for, you know, a health security perspective. So in terms of vaccine supply, just to put it in perspective, in a given year, usually 4 billion doses are produced. 
for addressing the COVID pandemic, we need at least 14 billion doses. So just imagine the raw materials supply chain, because these vaccines require a huge amount of raw materials. And so we really need to be tracking and encouraging the countries that have a raw material supply can ramp up the raw material supply to work together. That be with, you know, India is a major itself, a major supplier of the global vaccines. And so we need to support whatever we can to ensure that vaccine gap that Dr. Kang mentioned is addressed. And I think that can happen through both advocacy, understanding where the bottlenecks, where can we release that and how and how and do it very quickly. So just recently, you know, the filters, for example, were an issue and were needed for vaccine supply. So the U.S. government is now going to be providing filters. They're also going to release the supply as soon as the FDA clears the extra uh, supply of the AstraZeneca vaccines. We need more. We need sort of all the vaccines that are available to be provided. The uh, Lastly, I will say, obviously, from a, a global perspective, we're already now starting to see neighboring countries like Nepal and Pakistan and Bangladesh that are starting to see an increase in cases. So we really want to sort of think about this as being a, a, a global a global issue that we want to support. You know, I think it wasn't maybe just India, like Dr. Galeria mentioned, that was hoping that 2021 would be the story of putting the pandemic behind us. Um, and suddenly we're seeing places that were not maybe hit as hard in 2020 have this fierce um, COVID pandemic again here in 2021. What do you think the lessons are for right now for the world of what's happening in India? Yeah, I think what the lessons are is that, you know, um, it seems that with each subsequent surge, um, you know, the, it seems even more impactful in terms of the healthcare resources, public health resources, economic sort of impacts. I mean, we similarly saw this with our second uh, surge was worse than the first. So we all have to be prepared. It requires planning, um, anticipation. We cannot be complacent. We cannot let our guard down. And we really need to ramp up vaccinations. Unfortunately, we're not going to treat ourselves out of this we have to vaccine the vast majority of the population in this, on the planet to really be able to overcome the COVID pandemic Great. and address um, vaccine hesitancy and the like that's occurring with the vaccine distribution. Thank you. But before we go, I want to um, give our the two uh, experts from, from India who have joined us an opportunity to, to add, um, you know, their final thoughts. Um, Dr. Galeria, you know, with um, the situation that you're facing, the crisis that, that your, your hospital is experiencing every day, um, are there particular messages that you want the world to know? So I think there are two or three things that we need to do. Of course, uh, from the global perspective, we need to really get support from as many vaccines as we can. The Indian government has now opened up uh, import of vaccines from uh, and any vaccine which has got emergency use authorization from the US, UK, Europe, Japan, or by the WHO can be now administered in India. So we should look at how we can increase our vaccination drive by getting vaccines, not only those which are being made in India, which could be provided from across the globe. And as has rightly been said, that the pandemic will truly really come under control when we are able to vaccinate a large number of people, because the more the virus replicates in a certain area, the higher the chances of variants developing, which may develop an immune escape mechanism. So I think there has to be a global effort to try and support vaccination, and that has to be done for all the vaccines, whether they're being made in India or for other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. Also, we need to really work aggressively in seeing how we can decrease the number of cases. So COVID-appropriate behavior, how we can really drive home this message that it's not only the infrastructure or the hospitals, but the public uh, health issues in terms of preventing crowds and pre preventing the transmission is very, very important and how one can sort of drive that and make sure that that is also done aggressively is something that's very important because the healthcare system can only expand to a certain limit. After that, unless the cases come down, you are going to have a huge uh, problem in terms of management and that will increase morbidity and mortality. So I think it's important for us to have a multi-pronged strategy with support from the world in terms of vaccination, in terms of um, improving the health infrastructure, but also in terms of trying to decrease the number of cases by uh, pushing for a COVID appropriate behavior in many ways. Great, thank you, Dr. Kang, do you have uh, any final words? Put this in perspective. We're 
seeing almost a perfect storm in India right now remind the world of how important it is to pay attention to to COVID and and keep all of these different um, uh, strategies that Dr. Galeria is talking about very much at the forefront? Well, I think just not for India or not for the U.S., but for the whole world, one thing that we need to focus on is to remember what we've been through and use it to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You know, countries with the best resources in the world did not manage very well. And preparedness, where you link surveillance, the ability to respond with your medical care systems is going to be critical. And for India, if there is a specific ask, I would ask for uh, helping us with some of the science that we need particularly in regard to bioinformatics and to virology for us to be able to characterize the variants that we have now as well as the ones that will come in the future. Thank you. Well, that's certainly important for India and for the whole world. Uh, I really want to thank all of you, um, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Khan, Dr. Galaria, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.